Uh, you want to have a pen in your hand right now, your notebooks open, because this is going to be a super, super gift for you guys. We've had uh, Jay's been here before, Brian's been here before, but this is a super treat when both of them are together. So first, yes, I know a lot of you may not know who you may, uh, hopefully you know who both of them are, but if not, I want them to give you a little quick background of what they do, what they've done. Okay, so Brian, why don't you start us off? So I'm Jay Abraham's prize student. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously he's so much older. Um, That's true, unfortunately. Not a lot of them. Um, so I, I, uh, I've, I've been in uh, the direct marketing business for almost 40 years. Um, I helped build a company called Boardroom. I love that purple shirt, by the way, back there. Thank you, thank you. We got that memo this morning, right? Um, so um, I, I helped build a company called Boardroom Inc., uh, which was a, it, it still is, a newsletter and book publisher, all direct marketing. I can define direct marketing later. Um, but basically we sold a lot of subscriptions and a lot of books. And so my claim, one of my claims to fame that you can um, relate to is that I'm responsible for about two billion pieces of direct mail uh, and impressions in marketing, and I did not look every step. Um, thank God. So it, 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 we built a big business, uh, five million when I got there. Uh, we had a high of about 160 million. Wonderful, wonderful business. Decided to leave that um, uh, four years ago because I really believe, and I sent this plaque to Mike, um, as a matter of fact, because I have one on my wall, and it said, um, you know, those of us who have done it have an obligation to teach it. And he did it, he's teaching it. I do it, I teach it. He did it, he's teaching it. And so the last four years, I've been spending my time with the best direct marketers in the world in mastermind groups. One of my members is right there. One of the best marketers in the world, Robert Scrobe. And so I put together a group of marketers that are multi-channel. They, they don't just work on Facebook. They don't just do direct mail. They do everything. And uh, Mike is in my group, as is Rob and, and Mike Disney. And I just I want to teach the rest of my life. I want to I want to share everything that I've learned in marketing, and that's my mission. Yeah, I want people to pay me for my time, sure, but it's not about the money. It's really about um, being able to take the fundamentals of direct response marketing and bring it to a whole new generation of marketers. So that's me in a nutshell. That's 40 years. Doesn't sound like much, but that was it. <laughs> that's awesome. Awesome. And Jay, and if you guys hear these things going ching, cha ching, yeah. that means now you guys want to get as many of those as you can. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that means they see money and they're hearing that money. That was fucking 40 years. I should get a lot more than that. <laughs> okay, check your buttons. Check your buttons, everybody. All right. All there, right. Thank there you. you. How many of you have done 40 years of anything? Come on. Okay. Right. You have. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Jay, what about yourself? Share a little bit about who you are, what you've done. Um, okay. I grow businesses for a living. <laughs> if you take that as a springboard, I've been privileged to be involved, exposed, uh, impacted by, impact a broad spectrum of relatively respected, iconic people around the world in a broad spectrum of industries and I've been able to learn a lot about a lot of industries and distill down unique and universal principles that could be borrowed and and combined to give people uh, relatively profound advantages plus I've done a lot of work on trying to elevate the stature and the meaning of somebody's business in the eyes of their marketplace so that you have a preemptive and a preeminent role, and uh, I've been uh, relatively successful doing it. How's that? That's good. I want to. I'm going to mm. add something because Jay won't brag as much as he should. Um, so um, the book that you have there, getting everything you can out of all you got. What Mike said earlier about that. What you. What reading that book. I mean, as, as Jay would say, it, it'll be really useful if you do read it. Uh, but you have to read it. Um, I give that book away. I have hundreds in my, in my warehouse. And I met Jay circa 1985. Uh, Jay was the, uh, the preeminent person in the newsletter business at the time. Financial newsletters it was a big business back in the 80s. It still is, but it's, it was a really big business in the 80s. 
and Jay used, he was charging $25,000 a day before it was fashionable to do so. And everybody paid him, and everybody wanted to be with Jay. And he, um, he befriended me at a very, very young age uh, because he saw that I was willing to learn the principles that he was teaching. And I think I want you to understand that for the last 40 years, one of the big principles I have when I teach and when I run my mastermind and when I do any kind of client work, and if I was working with any of you in your service business, the thing that I would tell you, the first thing you have to do is you must, what I call, assess your assets, which is really what that book, it's basically getting everything you can out of all you got. People underestimate what they have at their fingertips already, and they always want to go after the new big whiz-bang. And of course, in today's world, and I sound like grandpa here, but I don't mean <laughs> to, that the, the new whiz-bang, I mean, there's this internet thing, it's going to catch on. And so, you know, get, 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 get out of your AOL email address, though. I think <laughs> that would be a good idea. But I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that it's, there's so much there that's so whiz-bang, and yet the fundamentals of marketing and business are all the same. Jay and I talk about this all the time today, and not because we're a couple of old fogies who want to justify our existence. It's really true that if the great marketers of today who are all online understood how paying postage would make them a better marketer because of the discipline that they'd need in their marketing, that's what I learned from this guy in 1985. So I just want you to get a sense that, that um, you know, you probably don't know me, but you probably knew him. And that CEO warrior, this is not the norm. Like, you know, I'm, I'm famous in certain circles. He's way more famous than I am. And that CEO warrior and Mike and his team can bring us here because we want to be here. I just want you to understand how, how amazing that is. Um, I, happen to, I happen to have gone to Rutgers, so coming to New Brunswick is kind of coming home for me. But... In a lot of ways, like, we don't have to do this, like, and we want to do this because we see what, what CEO Warrior is doing for an entire, the entire service industry, and it fits so well into our missions, That's I think, true. of being teachers and being, um, and, and we love this guy, too, so, you know, I just want you to know, I want you to know that um, going in, not because we're so famous or so elitist, but we don't do this for everybody, I guess, and yeah, I just want yeah. you to know that. And I, I think a nice thing... Uh, save that. You'll just clap real loud for, for these guys when they're done. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. But we keep bringing the money buttons. Keep bringing the money buttons. I think uh, one of the things that both of these guys are going to bring perspective to you, and I have a list of very strategic questions that I'm going to uh, ask them, is that Jay has worked in over a thousand different industries. A thousand. And uh, like Brian says, he's not going to brag about himself, but I think there is things that impress me. I mean, when a, when a guy has the skill set you know, and I'm going to share a quick story about the dentist that I think is amazing. Oh, yeah. When you have the skill set that you could go out there and somebody is not going to just, um, they're going to happily pay $150,000 for a day. Some of you in the room might say, wow, that's crazy. But the question is, if you can get the answer to solve all your business and life's questions, you know, um, what is that worth to you? 150,000 is chump change. I mean, it's nothing. <laughs> and I mean, it's the dentist uh, scenario that, you know, the guy goes to the dentist, and this is good for you guys to know in the service industry, and then I'm going to tee up the first question. The guy goes to the dentist, and the guy pulls out his tooth. And the dentist, uh, the guy says to the dentist, he goes, $375, and it took you five minutes to pull out the tooth. He goes, oh. He goes, if I knew, you should have told me that. He goes, I could have pulled that tooth out as slow and long as you wanted it to be, <laughs> right. right? So like pain is a choice. It's, it's an option there. All right, let's see up question. We will go, let's go Brian for the first question, then we'll rotate. So uh, one of the things is the power of speed. Today, um, and the power of speed, the way I look at it is this event is built for four days, not to take time, but to speed up time. And today with... Amazon and Zappos and, and Costco, you do not have an option to be slow. So talk about the power of just speed in a business. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, um, I probably wasn't as quick. If I had you as a coach, I think, you know, when I was running boardroom, I probably would have been a little faster. <laughs> um, but speed, you know, you know, they always say, you know, uh, done is better than perfect sometimes. And so I do believe that you really want to, you know, get off your ass. What was the, the phrase this morning of when you're talking to Mike Disney about 
getting started, but staying started. Stay started. Yeah, I like that a lot. But the thing about like being in a group, like being in a, whether it's in a, a live event or a mastermind group or whatever, I, I, made, I made two notes on this that really resonate with me. I don't know if they'll resonate with you. I hope so. One is that, and why I run mastermind groups, like I run a $20,000, $25,000 mastermind group that I bring together these marketers and they, they, we meet three times a year and we're exchanging ideas and all that. And what I believe that the speed, the, the accelerated speed that these companies can do because they're in a group, I call it the what and the who. And, and that's why people go to groups. It's be, for the what and the who. So what's the what? So people come to my mastermind group and Robert Scrobe is one of my members and Robert Scrobe is one of the world's experts on retention and back-end marketing and so he gets up in front of my group and he talks about retention deficit disorder at this last meeting two weeks ago and so that's a what that's a what that you can't get you can go find a book you can go use the Google um, you can do whatever you want but hearing it from someone who's been there done that that's going to accelerate the speed yeah. of how you're going to move ahead in your business and you're absorbing it. I mean, you probably feel it here. You know, being in a live event is way different. That's a big aspect of speed. So that's the what. And then once you know what the what is, who's the who? Because you don't got to do everything yourself. You know, I think the, the session before this uh, that Denise did about, you know, knowing what you do well, knowing what, you know, the, the speed is going to be accelerated so much more if you know what, what, what uh, entrepreneur coach Dan Sullivan calls your unique ability. You've got to know what your genius zone yeah. is. You've got to know what you do better than anybody else, and you've got to buy everything else around the corner. But you've got to buy it smart. So how are you going to buy it smart? It's got to be vetted. How does it get vetted? Well, I just happen to know that there's like a bunch of companies out there that got vetted by CEO Warrior. So I'm using this as an example because that's why I'm here. But this is a model for acceleration in your business that you can't get any other way. So that's the what, and then you find the who to do the what if you're not going to do it yourself. And the third aspect, which I don't do anymore because I'm too old, but it's the how, the how. And the amazing thing about, you know, being in the right groups, being around the right people to accelerate your business is that you're going to know how to do it. Whether you're going to do it yourself, whether you're going to, you're going to have the step-by-step, -step, whether you're going to have the manual. So that's, a big, that, that's, that's one. So one big area of speed is the what, the, the who, and the how. And then the second thing I just want to mention briefly, and then I'll, I'd like to hear Jay on this too, because the second piece is like a kind of a softball to him, which is... Dan Sullivan, the, the best entrepreneur coach in the world, says that what marketing was, what, what management was to the 1980s and 90s is now coaching. Marketing, uh, management has become coaching. And I, that's a huge, huge distinction because you can get all the manuals you want, you can get all the how-to marketing, all the how-to customer service, all the advice on putting posters up in your office, but if you don't, if you don't, do it under the guise of someone who's done it before, who's going to make sure you do it and that you're accountable to it. And that's what coaching is. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, there's a business. Now, I know a guy, he's, he, he like sells a, a mastermind to teach people how to be coaches. And he charges like $75,000 a year to be in this group. I'm like, I don't know how he gets that kind of money to do it. But people understand that the the... The idea of having a coach by your side, I and mean, you know it. I mean, the goddamn Patriots, fuck them. <laughs> um, oh, boy. Spoken like a true Jets fan, right? They're amazing. I mean, you know, when is Belichick going to go away? Never. Never, right. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. So now I have more nightmares for the next 20 years. But, but I, I'm using that literally as coaching. But, you, but it's so obvious you know, I mean, did you watch the game? Was the, the game was a snooze, but you know, the hot new coach got out coached by the master. New England doesn't even have that good a defense. That defense looked like it was like the '85 Bears. So coaching is the new management, and understanding that if you don't have coaches by your side, you're not in accountability groups. You're not going to have speed. You'll get there maybe on your own, 
Yeah. But why don't you want to accelerate that? So yeah, I, and I uh, think what's great about that, what's so exciting about me, uh, especially <clears throat> for this event, I don't think I've ever had so many of my coaches out. You're one of my coaches. Jay's one of my coaches. Robert's one of my coaches. <laughs> Dan. Dan in the back is one of my... Like, I've never had an event where I've had four of my coaches, which is a fair amount of pressure for me because you guys are watching every move I'm making. But also, I'm honored uh, to be there, to be and, here and, with and you and, guys. And, and um, I'll just say, you, you, you coach me a lot. That's why I'm here. Thank so. you. Thank you. Uh, Jay, power of speed and getting people to move faster, move more successful. Okay. Um, if I may, I'll, I was listening to Brian, and uh, he went a little uh, benevolently rogue on the subject, so I'm going <laughs> to bring it back and give you some, some interpretive comments. The man, the man who invented the tangent is accusing me of yes. the tangent. Yes. Yeah, I do it on purpose because we're going to start making this really, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I liked, is, was it retention deficit? Is that what he retention had? Retention deficit disorder. So I'll and give you one. Appearance. I love it. I'll give you one that you should strive for, and that's tension deficit. Mm. If you can get to that point, you have a lot more clarity. But I think you have to understand what speed represents. And I'm going to give you a, a, a contradiction to slow down before you go fast. And I'm going to give you a couple of perspectives. Number one is speed needs to be a function of something strategic. Now, if you could, I'm going to give you different categories to interpret speed. If you understand... Uh, direct response marketing and you in, in, uh, put, it, or in, in put it into your business, the faster you experiment with a hypothesis, win, lose, or draw, the faster you get to the right outcome because it will tell you the data will always talk. If you talk about speed being the ability to shortcut knowledge um, gathering because you are plugging into people who have already have 40 years or 30 years or 500 million dollars or in my case 20 or 30 billion dollars that's another interpretation of speed there's a, a really cool quote one of Brian and my both and by the way I am more I just was having fun with him I am a poster boy for adult attention <laughs> deficit you know what? I don't think you can be an entrepreneur and not have it. So I, like, I think so, but I think managing it's not a disease. it. No, but it is. It is a gift that has to be very uh, masterfully recognized and managed. I live in a world that is predicated on strategic. Uh, uh, I guess I'd call it optimization, and optimization is getting the highest and the best result, outcome, payoff, current residual for everything you do, everyone you do it for, everyone you do it with. The problem with trying to do that is left to your own devices, you're very limited to what you've observed, what you've read, what you've seen at a seminar. You need to have a context, or better than that, you need to have a uh, direct connection to people who've been there and done that and can not only share with you what is better, higher, safer, more residual. And I look at everything from the interaction, the capital, the access to the market, the communication, what you're ethically setting someone else, someone to do the next and the next and the next. And if you don't think about all that, then you are leaving. You, 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 the speed to do something can be... Uh, almost hypocritical because you're really not speeding towards your long-term strategic goal. You're speeding towards a tactical, sort of a static outcome. And I'm babbling a little bit here. I wrote down something that I love. We've never done this, but I think something like Mike is rapid and, um, and sustaining rehab for entrepreneurs who are addicted to bad strategy and marketing and business modeling, and uh, have a predisposition towards uh, unknowingly having terrible recidivism. You go and you get a great idea, and it's intellectually stimulating, and you go back and you get engulfed in the vortex of the day-to-day -day status quo, and you never do anything. Just some more, I don't know if I'm giving you good or bad answers, but I got a couple other things. Accelerate and elevate are two very different things. 
So you got to be able to integrate the two. Uh, attitude, altitude, it's sort of interesting. I don't want to get into that too esoterically today. But accelerating speed is good, but elevating continually what you're doing gives you three advantages. One, you're playing a much higher game. Two, you're getting much greater positive leverage out of what you're doing. And three, you're, uh, you're positioning yourself demonstrably and preemptively above and beyond the maddening crowd. I'm just giving you some thoughts. One of the people that Brian and I uh, truly uh, admired, he's deceased, a man named Gary Halbert, who was an insanely crazy, brilliant marketeer, copywriter, had a great quote, and he said that more has been accomplished in history and life by movement than is ever accomplished by meditation. We live in a world where you can take any hypothesis, any supposition, any conjecture, and it should not be, and I'm just going right to our hero's rhetoric, it's not original, it should not be decided by you or your spouse or your marketing people. It should be affirmed or rejected by testing it and asking the market to vote because the market will vote. They either respond well, they won't. And speed needs to be factored into, uh, into your understanding of variability. And I'm going to get ahead of myself. But where variability comes in is that uh, you're not playing a one-size-fits-all game. In fact, you have to understand the game you're playing and the rules that you have decided to impose on yourself because you can extricate yourself from that and elevate and accelerate it. But lots of different types of buyer's prospects are worth lots of different amounts depending on where you get them, how you get them, the way you uh, you uh, solidify them, and I'm getting probably way ahead of myself and going rogue. So you have <laughs> now Mike can bring us both into uh, yes. into centrist sort of thinking. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm in the middle. Here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so one thing <laughs> that was so important that he said that you should write it down and remind yourself is it's not a one size fits all. If it's if it was a one size fits all, everybody in this room would have the same equal or better success than the other, right? It is a your size fits you now, right? That's why, you know, there's two types of people. Well, I'm going to use um, one type of person runs an event out there. It doesn't matter. It's a five-day event. It's called Business Mastery. And the, the concepts are so generic, nobody really can implement it at all. Nobody's ever left that I know and all of a sudden 10 times, 100 times their business because it's so vague versus pulling it down to a point that all of you could say, oh, okay, I could apply this one thing right now and move forward. The other thing that both of these guys were moving forward on there is, and you want to write this down, um, production is not progress. If production was progress, you would not see over and over again on Shark Tank, one of the biggest things that you hear from them when they have you know, no sales or they need help. What do they say they have a warehouse full of? Answer for me. What do they have? Inventory. Well, if, if production was progress, you know, they would not have a warehouse of inventory. Right. The problem is, and you want to write down, progress is progress. Like I would ask yourself today, right now, I would say, um, not what production I did yesterday here in your company, what progress did you make yesterday? And I think it goes to that Al Pacino, we should play that, uh, the video, where it is a game of inches. What he's saying is the game of inch is an inch of progress moving forward. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. Yes? Yes. yes? Okay, there will be a point that we will just put you in a hypnotic state of wisdom, and that's okay. Just sit there and just let it uh, keep coming in. And then you'll make no <laughs> progress. So, yeah, we better get them out of that state. Well, that's why I got the bat. Remember yeah. the bat with oh, the, yeah, we got the, the barbed bat. wire on it? The, the, yeah. Then when we say send money, we'll explain later. Don't even question it. Yes. Just yeah. open your checkbooks or your credit cards, black ones particularly, and give them to us. Uh, you're talking about the cult of CEO warrior. Yes. Right? Well, yeah. Right. Well, where is Joe Giannone in here? Is he in here? Joe, okay, so Joe's right here. This is a great story. Uh, I'm going to share it, Joe. So, and you guys will find this. Uh, so we were at, Joe, when did you join Warrior? It's a couple years ago? 
third year. And so, Joe, we were talking, and it was the day, and uh, you know, we'll invite a bunch of you to lunch. Uh, what we have may not be a fit for all of you, but it's probably fit for, uh, for most of you. And I said, you know, this is what we do. And Joe pulls out his credit card. Remember this, Joe? And he goes, okay. He throws it on stage, which fell behind the damn stage. It, it was wedged down there. But that's the point. You know, it's never about the money you pay. It's always about the return. Right. You know, it's not when they pay Jay 150000 for a day, they don't say, oh, I'm so mad. They say, holy crap, we're a billion-dollar company. That's just saved us $100 million. It's always about that. And I always tell people, it's going to be the same thing for you. It's in the room as we're teaching you and guiding you, there'll be a couple things that will happen. One, you're going to ask yourself, do you trust us? Number two, you're going to ask yourself, do you trust yourself? And three, do you trust yourself and trust us, what we're saying? And I found out, hands down, what normally happens, Gary, is most people don't trust themselves. Right. This is what keeps them track, you know, keeps them back. Can, can I interrupt respectfully? Yeah, absolutely. So... I was impacted a couple of months ago by a very profound thinker who made a startling, stunning, and very, very eerie point to me. He said most, well, he used the word entrepreneurs, but I can get deeper and say most people are not entrepreneurs, they're proprietors. But let's, let's give this group uh, credit for being a true entrepreneur, and we can explain what the definition and meaning is later. But most entrepreneurs are two-dimensional thinkers. If you really want to own your market sector world, you have to become a three-dimensional. And I'll give you the, the very simple context with one more, one more dimension and then give it back to Mike. A two-dimensional thinker is someone who looks at their business and takes revenue and, and deducts expense and has remaining profit. A three-dimensional thinker understands that but they look at another dimension and that dimension is yield when i invest in this what do i get back first stage second stage year one year two first transaction second transaction when i invest in this media or this proposition or this uh, service model you know what does it bring in how does it evolve into cash flow or referrals or this and if you don't factor yield into your thinking, you are limiting dramatically the upside leverage. I deal in the world of geometric growth for business. Let's call it the geometry of business. And you all have the ability to harness it, but you have to understand the differentiations between you and everyone else. And you have to be uh, very, very aware of, of focusing on those dimensions others don't. The, the last point, and then I'll go back, is another person coincidentally said, if your business was a mutual fund, would you buy it? And by that he, or, he meant, yeah. if you look at a business, it has a lot of activities. And those activities, whether you break it apart or not, have yield. And if you were investing in a mutual fund, and a mutual fund theoretically invests in a broad spectrum of uh, investment classes, if you had 10 different investments that were equally distributed and you never knew that one was 40% risk, 2% yield, and another was 40% yield, 2% risk, would you be happy if that fund manager was equally distributing your capital there? Because that's usually what you are doing to yourself. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, that, I, I mean, people talk about would you buy would you buy your business too? Yeah. So it's the same principle, and you know it's up it's all it's all in your power about what you're doing. I think Jay also just hinted at something that we're not going to probably go real deep on marketing concepts and those. How many people have been here when I've been here before? Wow, I better be careful not to be on too many <laughs> reruns because um, I, I only say the same stuff over and over again. <laughs> um, but, but there's one that should be said over and over again and that your whole business is based on the lifetime value of your customers. And so, you know, LTV yeah. or lifetime value, what, you know, retention, as, as Robert talks about, it's, it's, the, it, it's, it's one of those, like, um, and, and so I love the way Jay put it in terms of, like, you better understand the yield of your business. Mm -hmm. And also it will enable you to figure out what can you afford to lose on a first sale? Or invest. Or invest in a first sale, a first customer, a first visit to their home, a consultation. What are you willing to invest to make it back tenfold, twentyfold, a yeah. hundredfold? 
years later. Yeah. But that's that's a tenant of marketing, yeah. of business building that everybody needs to I have. I think the, the, the difference there, what you're saying too, is you know there's a difference between you know an employee, which most business owners are actually act like they're just an employee, right? Um, an owner, or what we talked about with wealth, a wealth investor. I think, you know, I, this is a pet peeve of mine. I always find, who's, who has helped one of their kids go through college? Raise your hand. Okay, look at the hands in the room. I've always found it uh, amusing, partially entertaining, that a parent will easily, without much questions of, at all, will send their kid to college in hopes. Now, let's be honest with you. Whose kid went to college and came out, and it doesn't matter how long ago, they're not doing what they went to college for. Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, now you send a kid to college in hopes that they come out, and it wasn't a party, and it cost fifty, eighty, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000, and, but that's, a, that's like a parent mindset versus a wealth investor mindset. See, a wealth investor, well, I did a lot of TGI Fridays and Wendy's. Um, I wired a ton of these with Rob. And I asked the guy, you know, I'm curious, like, you're going to build a building. It's, it's $2 million. And then you have to sell Wendy's French fries and hamburgers. And how many hamburgers do you need to make to get this investment back? He says, you're thinking about it all wrong, Mike. He says, look, I don't need, and this you want to think about, that there's people that are investing and they got to get a return now. That's not a wealth investor. That's, that's normally a bad business person. He says, or, or an internet marketer. Or an internet <laughs> marketer. Yeah, that's good for sure. And he says, I just need, he goes, in five years, we have to, now think about this a minute. I said, well, how'd you pick the location? He goes, look, I've already surveyed the market. I know the day we open, we're going to sell a thousand French fries. How do you know? He goes, well, I've already did the research. And I said, okay. He goes, I also know that in five years, this thing will start making me 28 to 35%, depending, a, a profit through this. And I'm like, what is, and what that taught me by asking this guy was, this is a wealth investor mindset. And the service industry is plagued with, I need the money right now. The wealth investor mindset is I will put up a building, like this building, Rob and I own 10,000 square foot, the other building, 15,000 square foot. We don't say, well, we're gonna buy this building and I hope tomorrow it puts cash in our pocket. It's good if it can, but I want it to create cash over time. Does that make sense, Jay? You wanted to share something there. Yeah, a, a couple of things. It's, a, it's very pro profound. Uh, you have an allowable cost that you can invest, not spend, in different kinds, types of, I call it clients, sources, services. If you don't know what that is, then what it means is you're either under or overspending. And anyone who allocates a percentage of sales or an arbitrary amount to marketing is uh, very promiscuous because you're either spending too much or you're spending too little and you're definitely spending it the wrong way. But uh, to what, what um, Mike was saying, you know, it, it, and I always say this, I'm not the one who has invested their hopes, their dreams, their life, their sense of economic, psychic, uh, purpose-based fulfillment in an enterprise. I'm not the one who's investing eight, 10, 12 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week. I'm not the one expecting it to provide my income, my kids' life, you know, support my retirement. You are. I'm just the one trying to basically shock you through what I'll call positive catharsis to, catharsis to realize that there's so much more you can do with everything you've got, your time, your effort, your access, your capital, your human capital, your relational capital, your interaction, your communication. And if you're not aware, then you are sub-optimizing. And if you're competing in a world where you need to be able to outthink, out-strategize, out-market, out-contribute, out-position, out-preempt, out-really, uh, contribute out value create yeah. you better know what that means or you're not going to do a very good job of it yeah. so I, I, I would say also that you got boom um, I would <laughs> say you got the, here's the good news for a business like yours businesses like yours you're a service business it's a lot of it's a lot of personal communication it's a lot of investment of time I made that 
flippant joke about internet marketers not thinking about the long term. The reason why, I'm, it's not a put down per se, but it's, it's easy to say that because think about it. If you've got a piece of content or something you want to sell that you can get on Facebook very inexpensively, the barrier to entry to be an internet marketer of any kind of information product is virtually nothing. Yeah. So therefore, you can be really sloppy and b do a really crappy job and make a little money. That's not building a business for a lifetime and for the long term and playing a long game. You actually don't have that luxury, which is the good news, because you have to make that commitment the way that you know, Mike was talking about buying the building. But more than that, you've got to have staff. You've got to have people to go out to people's houses and fix their boilers and, 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 and rewire their, 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 you know, their, um, their electricity. So I, I think that what we're talking about here is, is easier. It's, it's a lot of hard work. What did, what did Mark, Mark Ford at our last event, uh, who's a great uh, copywriter, said, you know, when you're looking ahead, you know, it looks like luck, but when you look back, it looks like hard work. Um, oh. So, you know, I think that you have it built into your businesses that you have to look at the long term. You've got to look at it making investments, being a wealth investor, and not looking for short-term income events. And so that's a beautiful thing. Right. So that, you know, it's interesting yeah. thing about that. You know, a lot of people see we're in. Well, we've been in both worlds and we're in the world. So there there's the brick and mortar world. Right. Of building a business. And then there's this whole info marketing Internet world. It's everything you clicked on the the vitamin, uh, you know, the vitamin or the the report that's going to make you wealthy that you all clicked on. The difference is that I found out is someone who could build a successful brick and mortar company can be successful in anything. Somebody who's built, uh, most people that have built an info informational thing, they don't really understand the processes, the systems, the organization. They only know one thing, right. get them to click a button and hope that it's sustainable, which very, very little bit of that is long-term sustainable right. and, that and I see today. A lot of them, today. you see it, they, they, when they start, their business gets bigger because they've made so much money on all these clicks yeah. and they turn into orders, they don't know how to hire people. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's why I think you spend so much time. I mean, you did it for our, our mastermind group, you know, your yeah. whole system for how you hired yeah. staff at Gold Medal, which is an incredible system. But you're not going to learn that if you're getting people to, you know, click on bait. Uh, uh, don't get me started. But, yeah, yeah. We better um, go to Jay. Yeah, let's not. You're, you're going rogue. I'm going rogue. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go rogue. I'm going rogue. Okay. Jay, thoughts about that? Well, I just wrote down two things. And. Many years ago, I had a really interesting discussion. Do you know who Paul Pilzer is? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. He's an economist, and he's a, sort of a pop economist, but he's very bright. And he was served a bunch of uh, very high uh, uh, political uh, administrations over the years. But I said, to my mind, most uh, people in business are not really building a business. They're an elongated promotion. I mean, there's a very big difference. If you're trying to build a business, your discipline, your strategic thinking, your entire game plan is diametrically different. At least it should be, but if you don't know it should be, if you know it should be, but you don't know what the it that it needs to be, then you're at a diametric uh, disadvantage. And I wrote down that you need to master asset allocation as well as opportunity allocation. And if you don't recognize what those two are and assets, I mean, I, uh, Brian knows this, Mike knows this, I've done billions of dollars of uh, business utilizing intangibles. I think that the biggest overlooked, underutilized, and underperforming opportunity for almost any business is understanding we used to call it relational capital, we call it power partnering. I'm referring to it now in a way that there is an investment phrase, but it's not meant to be exactly that, but capital equivalents, because anything you wish you could do or had, had you the money, you can find someone else who's already got it, who can provide it for you on no risk, no 
liability, no equity dilution, but you have to understand, I'm getting rogue, but there's just a much higher game that you have always had, you, you have right now, and you always will have the ability of playing if you understand the rules. And if you do, the world is a 3D movie and you have within the realm of your competitive environment the only pair of glasses. So it can be pretty interesting. He yeah. just sa shared something that if you didn't write it down, I need you to. Write down the term underutilized assets. Let me tell you how important this is. One of, I had a call with Jay and he right away just, we're talking about one thing, but he asked me a question. And this is gonna start this conversation Then I wanna hear Brian's thought about this. He said, okay, you're running CEO, we're at the building. What happens with the building when no one's there? You know, what happens when the parking lot, when nobody's parking there? And it started to get me thinking. So in your, most of your industries, if you asked yourself, um, and that when I would walk through my warehouse, Mike Disney, he, he's not in here, Rob is, I would look and say, well, this water heater, it's got a scratch in it. That's an underutilized asset. Someone wants that for a savings, right? And then I would just look everywhere. So if you guys think like, you know, your trucks, they're not being used on the weekends or 50% or are not being used. Well, that's an underutilized asset. And what about your website? What about if you had a section on your website where you knew that you could prove to the pest control company that you don't own yet, and you said to them, look, I have, I have a space here that I would offer you to market on that space. And what if that him marketing on that space, you don't even have to do clicks or anything, it'd be per code. What if that paid for your, your update of your website, paid for the remodeling of your website, and then what about your list? Now I'm going rogue now, yes. because your list alone Somebody in your list wants to talk to them. Your list is your email database, right? A pest control, a, a garbage removal company, a, whatever, anything else that you don't do that's non-competing wants to talk to your customer, and they would do, I would love, I'll pay any of you. I mean, if they have a list of people that I want to talk to, I'd kindly pay you money because that's a conversation, and they already know that this is a great conversation because like and trust is already there. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we have a little discussion that, that your Amazon concept, I think, yeah. will tie into this. I just want to add one other thing to what Jay said before, and if you, if, if I, I probably said this at a previous time I've been on stage here, but this is, this is the line that I always think about, um, that everything in business and in life is not a revenue event, but everything in business and in life is a relationship event. So well, that if you, that's and, great. Which, which is yeah. something that I, if you live by that, um, you, you're going to look at your business so much differently. And again, I think I'm preaching to a group that is easily converted because of being in a high touch service business as opposed to a low touch. But I don't know we're about not that. talking about it enough. I don't know about that because today, um, relationships, uh, communication and relationships are not enhanced today uh, the way I feel because, I mean, do you feel a relationship is enhanced by a text message? No, a text message is a short, brief start of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. And if you look at, like, email. Now, if you're doing strategic stuff like we are where, you know, if you look at the communication tree, the very best communication tree, top of the tree is this. I'm talking to Brian. I'm talking to Jay. This is the very best. If you pull that down to what might be the next best, well, it would be video. Me FaceTime and Brian and Jay and we're on Zoom or something. Then when you pull that back, well, maybe it's I send you a video, but we're not talking to each other. Now, I can't go to the whole run, but let's go to the bottom. It's an email that says, hi, I'm thinking about you. Well, if I start this relationship, and this happens to a bunch of you every day, I guarantee, the most neglected thing is your existing list because you said hello you said, let's get married, you, give yeah. me money, and you never talked to them again, and then they said, yeah, well, you, you, I'll yeah. find another wife. Yeah, I wasn't, I, 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 important, I, I, was, I was not shortchanging what that relationship looks like. I mm. wrote a blog post last week, and it was called uh, Fishing Without Bait. And from a marketer saying that, you would say, wow, that's like, why, how could a marketer not use bait and not go fishing for clients and all of that? And my point was, here's, so here's the, here's the metaphor. I'll get really, really uh, poetic with you here. <laughs> so instead, you're sitting in a boat, and you're on a lake, 
and everybody in that, the inhabitants of that lake are all your potential clients, customers, people that you, wanna, you want to service their homes, right? And so you've got a tackle box and you've got a fishing rod and you can keep throwing that rod out there with a hook and bait and figure out, you know, someone's going to buy it at certain offers, you'll discount, you'll do this, you'll do that. However, in your business, keep in mind that you have a very, I think, a very episodic business. A lot of people, how many people here get their first piece of business sometimes because it's an episodic event because of a catastrophe in the house? Like something really bad happened and I got to find somebody to, to, that's an episodic event. So, the, here's, so here's the analogy of you take the fish, this is like a marketer talking, so I can't believe I'm saying this, <laughs> but you take the fishing rod and this is why the internet is so great. It's why relationship building is multi-channel. It's live, it's video, yep. it's email, it's text, it's everything. So you take the fishing rod, you put it in your boat with the tackle box, and instead you're in that lake all the time with a big spotlight, and you're always sending a spotlight to that lake. Mm -hmm. And this, it's a, I'm getting really poetic here for you, but I want you to get the image. And you're always, always communicating with them, letting them know that you're there when, they, when, when you need them. You're sending them free content. We talked about this in my previous speeches here. That you're giving them value and value and value because they don't need you yet. They haven't had that episodic event. So you're, that, that's the spotlight. The spotlight could be anything. Could be a text message, could be a video, could be a phone call, but you're constantly letting them, letting them know you're there when they're ready and when they need you. And guess what? The fish jump into the boat as opposed to going on a hook. Well, That's the metaphor, yeah. right? So there's a lot to this. I'm being very, you know, 30,000 foot view here. I can give you tons of, I'm not, a, I'm not the guy that's gonna sit here and go, go like rogue on, on ninja techniques of marketing. There's so many things you can do. But with that philosophy, do you see that you yeah. are now being a wealth manager and not a short-term revenue producing, get me cash today kind of business. And I, thank you. Yeah. And I think that that is a way of, and it was really interesting because I got this, this metaphor from Dean Jackson who's been to this event and I added a bit to it here. But all my speakers, I got the best marketers in the world in my mastermind group. I found it fascinating that this was what we were talking about. Yeah. Like we weren't talking about the next best hook and the next best piece of bait. We were talking about creating customers for a lifetime. And I'm really proud of the fact that my new book that comes out in April, that's a modest brag right there. Um, <laughs> so, but the subtitle of my, my book is called Over Deliver, which is not a word by the way, I made it up. Um, it's usually two words are hyphenated. And the subtitle is <laughs> build a business for a lifetime playing the long game yeah. in direct response marketing. That's my entire life in a nutshell. If I don't believe that, then you know, shoot me now. So, and and it's, it's, a lot of it is what I've learned from these guys too. What do you think, Ajay? Uh, Brian's actually, pushing. No, 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 this is great. <laughs> I was thinking about, and you made a great point, the long game is that the first thing you have to realize is the vast majority of businesses out there are not strategic, they're tactical. And I was thinking that if you build a business on one or a few tactics, there's no way it can, it might be able to endure, but it's going to be a struggle. You have to be able to understand that tactics can only be used and employed if they advance and enhance a masterful long-term strategic game plan and I was thinking about another one of my influencers who said for the same amount of effort and time, you can, you can create a business that's worth nothing at the end mm -hmm. or a business that's worth a fortune. For the same amount of effort and time, you can create a buyer that's worth one or two categoric transactions or you can create a client that has the ability to be worth a multitude of other related product service transactions because they trust you and they are logical extensions. When you have that kind of, uh, I guess I'll call it optionality, but one way you've got 
this and, and the other way, same time, same effort, you got this times, you know, infinity, you better learn how to play not just the long game, but the geometric game, the asset building game, the, if you talk about value creation, now I'm going a little rogue, value creation isn't just being the heating and air conditioning person. Value creation is realizing that that homeowner or condo owner has other extensive needs and left to their own devices, they're probably not going to have the discrimination to even know how to choose the best provider. And if it's a reasonably logic extension of what you do, whether you have to provide it internally, partner externally, private label, you are actually doing a value and a service. And this comes around to another concept, the concept of value, the concept of service, the concept of, of quality, all those are very subjective and are defined differently by different segments of the market. So you better know what their definitions are, you better know what their criteria are, because you can be very proud of the value and the quality and the service and the dependability that you're rendering because you know internally how hard it is to deliver, but it may be so irrelevant on their judgmental criteria that you're talking apples and oranges. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of things I want to point out that both of these guys said. Like you guys know yesterday we spent a lot of time on mindset. I think that's a critical factor to change the game. The second critical factor is what both of these guys were leading to, and you should write it down for sure, is stop selling and start serving more. Um, I believe I'm a great example of that. I do more Facebook Live, mail out more books for free to anybody on the planet. So I'm not surprised that in five years we've become the top training and coaching organization in the world compared to other ones that have been around for 25 years because they kind of did that in the beginning, but then they stopped. So why I'm doing a Facebook Live at you at 10 o'clock at night showing you how to recruit in a better way, they're sleeping because they're already fat and think they're, they're done forever. The other thing is about exiting, which I think kind of they were leaning to. You know, you got to know if you're going to exit someday, you better know your wise finish line and then know the timing on your finish line. And for all of you that ever think you're going to exit your company, it starts now for three years later. Because otherwise, and, and lastly, I want you to write this note down before I go to the next question that Brian and I are really excited about, is when you think, first off, uh, and this is so, I don't remember who told me this, but it is profound and you must think about it. One, all companies are built for one of two things, uh, selling or handing down to somebody. Um, number two, this is the one that will make you more money than anything. Run the business every day like you might sell it tomorrow. That will make you more money than any goal to anything. Because if you run at that level, that's, thank you, that someone's going to walk in. If I had in, a button, I'd push that one. Yeah, that's the invisible button. <laughs> if, if you ran your business like that, at that level, someone walked in the door and were like, I'll take it now. Just like they would go to Whole Foods and buy a ham or they're like, I'll take the turkey. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes? Now pay attention. All right, I want you to stay super engaged. I know it becomes a saturation point, but we're just putting it in your brain. I want to talk about cross-pollination. Cross-pollination is so key. Um, Amazon has now started to master this. And cross-pollination is the fact of, there's two parts of cross-pollination. There's cross-pollination, the theory of I educate my customer on all the things I do, might do, or are considering doing. Okay, so you're just a plumber, and you're like, I'm gonna do HVAC. I've already been, um, here's a little tip for you guys, a tip. Put a, a piece of uh, whiteboard in your customer service department, write that down, and every call that comes in that they're asking for something you don't do is money in your pocket in the future. Our answer was this, Brian, someone could call us up and say, hey, do you do dental work? Well, at this moment we don't, but we will let you know when we do and let us help you find a dentist. Because guess what? If I got 50 calls a day, someone saying, do you do dental work? Guess what I would do? It would be gold medal dental. Time to go to dental school. Yeah, e easily. So there's two parts that I want these guys to talk about. One, the power of cross-pollination for your customers. You can't be a, a one-trick pony anymore. We talked about that a little bit. And number two, the power of cross-pollination learning. And before I give it to Brian, I went to Disney World to learn from the executives. I do not have rides. 
I don't have It's a Small World, and I don't have Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck. But I went there to learn because that was the X factor for me, was bringing things from another industry that no one else saw in my industry, applying it, and no one, that's how you keep it. No one could ever catch up to me. It's hard to, cha it's hard to catch up to the bullet train. You get that? Brian, thoughts so, about this? So, yeah, so I'm going to, I agree with everything Mike said, but now I'm going to play my own level of devil's advocate just so I want you to see this whole picture. Um, it's true that, you know, having all of those services available is really critical. Like when that example you gave a couple of minutes ago about, you know, if you have this space on your website and you don't do pest control and the pest control person is willing to take that space, that's advertising space. Maybe no. you get a finder's fee if they use the pest control service that advertises on your site, but you're not in pest control. You don't have to be in everything. Yeah. However, what Mike said is really important. Know what people are asking for. Know what the related service is. Not so sure that you want to go too far afield. The dental, I think the dental um, example is good because you can think about what the line is of where you'll stop. Like, I don't need to be a dentist but maybe I do need to have a dental uh, uh, group where I'll get, I'll get a, a finder's fee for sending people to get their teeth filled or get a, get a crown. But it, when it's related, I mean, all the relatable, I mean, we had a call with Dan and Jay about all the other areas that CEO Warrior could be coaching in that aren't maybe as obvious and what kinds of things they can coach in because how they're going to coach HVAC and how they're going to coach plumbing is going to, how they coach carpet cleaners. Our buddy no. Joe Polish did that. It's a lot of the same type of coaching, but then it needs to get niched down. So this is where I break a little bit with the concept, but you need to do both. So you want to be as much of all things to all people within reason because that's the way the world's going. Thank you, Amazon. But the other side of it is when you sell all things to all people all the time in every sales message, yeah. you're going to kill yourself yeah, too much. and you're no longer being the solution to that particular problem anymore. So someone calls and their boiler blows up. Blows up. At that moment, you are the boiler expert. You're not the all side... All, you know, all, all, any size fits all for any problem in your home. And so when you, and, and by the same token, even when it's not episodic, when you're going out and prospecting new customers, even if you're offering more things in your business, but you want to go after people who might be selling, it's always easier to sell one thing than to sell a hundred things, always, or even five things. And if you can start having messages, whether it's outbound telemarketing, whether it's consulting calls on one aspect of your business, you'll get the other business. We don't have to be pigs right away, I guess is what I'm saying. You can be a pig. I, I want you all to be pigs in terms of in, in the best way possible. Make as much money as you can with everything you've got. Jay's book again. But I think it's very important. When I was here last time, if those of you who were here, I talked a lot about copy to list. Copy to list. I'm not even teaching you like an advanced marketing concept. Yeah. Copy to list. Want me to give you a great example of copy to list? I'm going to build a wall and I'm going to put a door in it. I'm not, that's not a political commentary. I'm not even going to tell you who I voted for. But did Donald Trump know who he was talking to that he had to talk about a wall because that was the best thing for them to understand? Yeah. Brilliant marketing. I always wondered if Donald Trump studied Gary Halbert yeah. uh, or copywriting. But my point here is that your business is all these businesses, but then don't get clouded into selling full service all the time. That would be my only little yep. caveat, but still keep making that list of what else you can. I mean, Jay taught me this 30 years ago. It's like you, if they're going to go buy that from someone else and you can deliver it, deliver it. Or at least partner with somebody and That's deliver what I was just it. Say. Right. So the partner partnership aspect, you don't have to like start a pest control business inside your building, but have a really strate great strategic partnership with a pest control company that you vet. And now that's the other piece. 
And that's why I think CEO Warrior is so powerful going well, back. Just so you know, I would do the pest control in your business. I would, actually, that one. Yeah, and the that one. The dentist, I wouldn't. No, right the away. dentist, right. I would. I would start another company for the dentist. One. Correct. Maybe but, I'll have Gary Lightfoot do the dentist. But, but in CEO company. Warrior, think about that. It's like, it's like Mike and CEO Warrior don't have to be in all those businesses out there, but you need all that stuff. And so that is still part of your business. It may be, in, and, and deciding what you want to take in house. I mean, it's yeah. always like, it's always a make or buy decision, yeah, yeah. whatever business you're in. So I might buy it for a while, and then once I realize that I'd rather make this and do it myself, and what it's going to cost me, and you do the yeah. P&Ls on it long term, then you bring it in. You can try it before you buy it, basically. Yeah. Pest but control. You gotta know it. Pest control, pest control you pest should do anybody in the service industry for one reason. Pest control, they go in the attic, the basement, around the outside of the house, and everywhere inside. It's one of the That's very few businesses out there that you probably could buy one today, talk to their list, cross pollinate, add. Too many people are trying to buy another plumbing company. I say that's that's not the greatest idea. Buy a pest control company, sell them plumbing, sell them pest control. Let the pest control say why they're in the attic. It looks like the furnace is bad when they're outside. Looks like the air conditioner. You should hit the damn button for this right now. I'm just telling you. Because if you ain't hitting the button, <laughs> you're missing out on some of the greatest wealth strategies uh, that you've ever heard right there. Just do that. Do that. Okay. Jay, wow. you were up. Okay. I mean, this is like your mm -hmm. principles, Jay. So you're, uh, yeah. you're done. I'm but done. see, you know what happens? <laughs> no, no, done. you're great. I, I forget my principles. This is very, it's very beneficial. By the way, apologies. I'm normally more fun. I have a little bit of a, of a headache today just because I'm not used to the East Coast. And uh, I... And uh, Brian's here. And, and yeah. Brian is intimidating yeah, to me. Brian's I, I give and, Jay a headache <laughs> all the time. And I don't know how to one-up him. So it's very... <laughs> uh, so... I'm going to tell you what this stimulated, and it's a little bit, it's going to be more than rogue. So, <laughs> so beyond that's rogue. The phrase. Rogue, more than rogue, yeah, 3D. rogue 3D. Son of rogue. <laughs> rogue awesome. means, meets, uh, what, what? Uh, I can't think of it, but I'll come back with the movie, <laughs> and you guys can all fund it. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do a private placement. Uh, so when I started in my career, it was sort of the accidental marketer. I was 18, I had no education, I had two kids. By the time I was 20, in the need of somebody 40, nobody cared. I became a business transient and bounced around amongst many different businesses, but the operative uh, and opportune word is in many diverse industries. And I did it because nobody gave me a salary, it was sort of eat what you kill. And what happened was I was not aware until a convergent sort of a catharsis happened. And after about the eighth industry, not business, in my transitory career, I realized, geez, people in this business don't have a clue how people in this industry, this industry, this industry, this industry separately think, how they market, how their strategy or tactics, access vehicles, value creations, uh, distribution channels. Not that one is better than the other, they're just different. However, upon analysis, I realized that in fact some were far easier, safer, more predictable, had more residual, more rapidity, uh, less risk, more everything. And I was able to borrow success approaches from not just one industry, but multiple ones, combine them into hybrids, apply them to industries where it had never even been seen, let alone used. And all of a sudden, everyone thought I was brilliant because we went from X to you know, 10 or 20 X in a year. And very honestly, if I was brilliant, it was only the awareness that I was able to recognize them and translate them. But start with the fact that the, the statistical probability that you have any grasp on the magnitude of what's possible from time, effort, opportunity, people, markets, communication, marketing, selling, buyers, uh, uh, prospects who don't buy, uh, service people, product buyers, 
that you have enough comprehension of the totality of optimal ways to, to mine them, monetize them, maximize them, perpetuate them is, uh, is, is, is ludicrous. You can't unless you've lived a much more expansive life. So you want to borrow knowledge from outside your industry. And there's a concept that I coined 40 years ago called funnel vision, which is the antithesis of tunnel vision. All you know is what you watch people in your industry do, what you have observed, or what you've read, or what you've seen at a seminar. It, it gives you incremental linear advantage, but in no way will it ever give you exponential growth advantage. It can't. Because all you're going to do is plus or minus 20, 30% more than your competitor until they mo you know, model and, and uh, equal or exceed you. So that's the first thing. Second of all, if you look at where breakthroughs come from in our world, it's rare that they come from within. They usually always come from outside. I'm going to date myself just because I'm going to go through some that are easy for me to refer to rather than some of the newer ones, uh, just because I used to talk about them all the time. But fiber optics was not created for telecommunication. It was created for aerospace and borrowed. Uh, Federal Express borrowed what's called the hub and spoke distribution system that the Federal Reserve Bank used to clear checks overnight. Uh, Rogaine was for pimples. Viagra was for heart. Either the ballpoint pen or the roll-on was for you know something else. But if you don't make it a point to travel outside your industry, and, and the analogy I'd say, all of you have traveled probably outside your, your city, your state, hopefully your country, hopefully your continent. And with every expanse, you see different ways of living, values, moralities, topographies, food, uh, architecture, traveling. Uh, grows the mind. One of the things you have to realize is in business, you grow or you die. It's not a static thing. You can't get to a point and say, Whew, thank God, now I'm going to basically just coast in 10th gear and never, and just ride, ride it out. Doesn't work that way. You either go that way or that way, but you'll never stay constant. Can I? Add, I just wanted one phrase that yep. Mike, Mike really, uh, really made me think about this because when when Mike was walking across the stage earlier today about walking around his company, you know, which is management by walking around, which is really important. Uh, Dan Kennedy has this phrase. He's a marketing guy that we all learned from, and he calls it marketing by walking around. And so it's, 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 uh, and it's not as narrow as you think, because I think yep. Jay just put a much bigger spin on it. But you, I mean, when Mike said he went to Disney to see how Disney does it, you should be like always thinking about, you know, when you're, especially if you're, if you're in a place where you're, in your perspective, customers are everywhere. Like you're in a regional business, right, in your town. You know, I, I mean, walking through Walmart and watching the behavior of people and what they do and how they do it. You have no idea what kind of copy platform you'll come up in your head or what the needs are. I, you don't know what you don't know. And so I think you're always, in my opinion, I always say marketing isn't everything, it's the only thing. But you're always in a marketing conversation because you're figuring out how to serve and not sell, which Jay said before. So I think that this idea of marketing by walking around is one of the most important things you can do, and you don't have to be a marketer to do it. Well, it's funny because, uh, you know, I think about, I think of Home Depot, all of you, you know, when I was still running jobs, Home Depot, um, customers, you say, I've seen that, that electrical thing in Home Depot for this, and I go, absolutely, and you could go get it, you could drive there, you could park, you could hope a cart doesn't hit your car, you could hope you don't get in some kind of argument in line, you could deal with somebody who probably is not the highest level educated in it. They might give you the right part or the wrong part. If you get the wrong part, now you got to pay an expert to come and pull it out. That costs <laughs> twice as much money. And then when the part fails, who inventories that part? Who comes out for that? So as you could probably see at this moment, you just wrote some Yeah. <laughs> at this moment, you're probably thinking that going to Home Depot and getting this could be the worst decision of your life. So would you like me to get started now? You know, and I've used that a ton of times right there. So I love what, what he was saying there. I want um, two thoughts for me and one last question, and I'm going to let these guys tee this up. 
The one thing that I think is super important about this cross-learning, and I thought of like Louise. Louise does, uh, uh, wait, does it do it? Who does basement waterproofing in here? Okay, basement waterproofing. Okay, and we have some warriors that do basement water. I did basement waterproofing. I did millions of dollars of basement waterproofing, millions of dollars in restoration. We did carpet cleaning and all that. I think what made it super fast for me was uh, one, I had to go pay people to go get it. A lot of people do franchises for that. I, I wouldn't say that's good or bad in this conversation. But I would say the good thing about in Warrior here, and I'm saying this for the Warriors, I'm saying this for Gary and stuff. Who lives in an area with basements? Okay. So this is worth saying right now. Like, we did basement waterproofing with no employees on the payroll, and it was one of our most profitable businesses we have. Now, it's a conversation for a different time, but the fact is we already have the basement waterproofing model. So if you have basements, but you're a plumber and don't offer basement waterproofing, this is almost a, a, a legal sin today <laughs> because I just give you the box and say, price it like this, do it like this, get the guy that sells it. Even our salesperson was a 1099, not even on the payroll. We did million dollars, uh, millions of dollars, fixed cost. Do you see how much money is there just from gets out? Now, it's easy when I give you the box and you do it. Franchise, it's good. It gives you the box. You got to cut them back 10 or 15% of whatever that is. The other thing, assets. This should blow your mind, you should be excited, and then we could, we could just stop the event now and go home, okay? So I'm gonna give you this one now. Your assets, one of the reasons why they purchased, um, took over gold medal is one, our brand could be put anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. So for you guys that have a good brand, but maybe you're doing one, two, five million, it's okay. If you have the scalability, the coaching support and mindset, you should do this. If you're in New Jersey, well, it's cold now. Well, you might want to take your brand, find someone who hasn't figured it out in California, partner with them, and now when it's warm here, maybe it's cooler there, you leverage the seasons. That's the power of a brand. You have an asset that someone else wants to use. Now, would I go to the franchise model with all the red tape logistics? No, I wouldn't do that. Would I white label that? Would I partner with somebody, license model that? Yes, I would. Jay, tie us up on that, and then I got one less question for these guys, and then we're going to get off the stage here. Um, one of the intangible assets that we've helped people generate uh, really tens of millions of dollars is processes, procedures, and knowledge base. Uh, I sold $250 million worth of seminars to people that wanted to be contingency marketing consultants. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, the person who's the co uh, CEO of Keller Williams before she did that. She sold her real estate firm and had a non-compete and we isolated that her biggest strength was listing and she went all over the country and made 50 uh, uh, to 100,000 a weekend teaching what she had done in her business. We had an attorney that made a uh, million dollars a year 30 years ago with one employee and he licensed I think 500 attorneys to do it outside his market. We had a, a lumber mill that figured out how to do kiln drying uh, in a way that, that which was 40% of the expense in lumber uh, that reduced electricity or, or, uh, or fuel by 40% and enhanced the outcome, meaning uh, grade AA or A lumber as opposed to scrap or warpage by double and he had 500 lumber firms around the world paying him that. We had a dry cleaner who uh, averaged four times what the average dry cleaner did in three uh, facilities but didn't want to grow, and he had a 1,000 people paying him $200 a month to use what he did. And we had a, uh, a uh, car wash that had a process for upgrading the premium car wash, and he had four times the average, and he got a thousand car washes to pay him two hundred dollars a month to use it. So I think it's viable. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really great. Um, last question for both of you guys. We'll start with Brian. Uh, it's a concept that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, not only because of my own uh, things that I experienced. Um, so Brian, talk about the cost of inaction. Hmm. Yeah, it. You know, I, I again, I think I said it before. You know. Uh, done is better than perfect. And the beauty, I mean, growing up as a direct marketer, um, everything, you know, I was taught very early on that everything is testable. You can go out small before you go out big. 
Um, but doing nothing it gets you nowhere. So using a couple of examples that we've already talked about today, you know, the money that, you know, Mike was very adamant about, like the money you're leaving on the table if you don't go into pest control yeah. or that you don't go into, um, you know, uh, basements could be like a make or break for your business if you actually went into it and did something. And, and can again, do it for free. And you can do it, right. You go into pest control with no money out exactly. of pocket. Exactly, that was nothing. Again, so I think the power of inaction, that, that, yeah, that would be the point, that you know, don't always think that because it looks like a new business model or a new thing that you have to invest a lot of money and time in that you still can't test it. There, one of my mentors, um, Gordon Grossman, who was actually one of, the, one of the architects of the old Reader's Digest. Anybody remember what the Reader's Digest was? Um, but they were like the big direct marketer in the 1960s and 70s. Um, they, they went bankrupt a couple of times because they didn't share very much with other people. But Gordon used to always say to me, and he was a consultant of mine and a mentor of mine, and he would always, like, I started having this idea about doing a new book or doing something new or expanding the business in some way. And his, his, this was the quote, and it sounds really stupid silly. He says, first find out if you have a business. First find out. So what does that mean? It means what's the minimum you need to do to see the viability of this piece of the business that you may want to put a lot of money and assets and time and people into later on, but what's the minimum I have to do that's going to prove that business model so then I can decide whether I want to invest more in it? And we did this easily in direct marketing because I knew these are the lists I had to test, this is the book, this is the audience. If I get this response rate, I know I can move to the next step. Yeah. That to me, is if you think about that, it'll get you out of inaction way faster because you're looking at the minimum you need to do without being cheap, without being like super, like but it's got to be roll out in, in direct marketing. We say, can you roll that out? Yeah. Or can you pyramid on that? Meaning if I mail 5,000 names, can I mail 25,000? Then can I mail 100,000? In this, if I do five clients in pest control with a partner, what does that look like? What are the margins? How does it feel? Does it seem to fit? Can I then start selling it a little bit? Now I go to, then I go to step two, because it might be rolloutable. Now do I hire uh, an expert in house yeah. if I want to? So again, that, I think what, it, what in action to me is usually an excuse for it's like bigger than my head. Yeah. Like I can't do it because it's too much. I can't prioritize. I can't get it done. So that would be my, you know, it, yeah. my response. You to know, it's interesting, uh, Brian. There's a lot of everybody. I always call. Uh, there's a lot of business owners just uh, sniffing the ass of the next business out there. It might be a little crude, but what they're doing is just following the next person. Which I always say, if everybody's going left, if you want to be wealthy, you don't go left. You go right. And he brought up something. I'm going to give you another thing you're going to want to write down, and this is going to make you a lot of money, and you can thank Brian and Jay later for this. Here's what I just thought of. First off, a lot of you are implementing things you think your customer wants, and you never ask them. Here's a question that you will ask your customers, and it will make you instant money. What other service would you like us to consider delivering to you? Boom. Done. What other service would you... And if they start telling you HVAC, now, if it's not something you want to do, like I probably, well, maid service is another one I think everybody should do, but that's, that's a, a conversation for a later time. But if they want something that just really I don't like, you know, like, I don't know, shoes. Well, I wish you'd sell shoes. I'm like, ah, I don't, I'm just not into it. I like Shark Tank is really key on stage when Mark Cuban and these guys go, you know what? I, I don't have any passion yeah. about it. If you're not passionate about it, you won't do it. Send that email. And what you could do is create it in a simple Wufu form. It's just a fillable form. And you could say, what's the one service? And then you could, at the bottom, say, if there was one more service that came to mind, what would that be? And the last thing, for thanking you, taking this time, I want to give you $50 off your next service and this special report for yourself. So I think that can make you, is that good or what's yeah. up? Good? Yeah, we, we, I mean, okay. this, this is marketing, uh, that we, con we call it concept testing or questionnaire testing. Yeah. We never launched a product in my, my 35 years at Boardroom without 
doing this kind of testing. I did it in direct mail, which is another way to do it. That's when you put the $2 bill in there. Um, and, but I like, I like, you know, if you're going to do it online, offering value. And just because you're giving them an ethical bribe to give you an answer, don't think the answer is not accurate. Yeah. It's accurate. Yeah. If and they want to be in your family, they're going to tell you the truth, hopefully, about what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. And also, I, I, I can't, yeah, that, your point about passion, so, so good, so yeah. important. Yeah. Make sure you guys, I know you're writing notes like mad, and that's awesome. I want you to do that. Lunchtime, you must fill out your strategy optimizer cards because you, as you could see, well, first off, anybody in the room, if you, if you invested or didn't invest because you're an existing client of ours, like if you haven't gotten 10 times your investment, I promise you the problem's not us. The problem's you. Ask somebody else in the room. You have to fill out your cards because lunchtime, build them out because remember, last day, we're putting our blueprint together. Jay, finish us off here with uh, anything about cost of inaction or anything you heard. Okay, but I will acknowledge that <clears throat> Brian did an exceptional job. So every I, I can die now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you should. You can put, that, you can put that on your on your um, on, on my your head. Jay so. said I did an exceptional job. Well, I have this idea. Let me ask you this as an aside. So do you think I could pre-sell? An ash from my ashes to people that like me. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That's like selling a piece of the Brooklyn Bridge. Think yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You could put it in a necklace yeah, if or that, a could, token. Do you, want, do you want me to do the yes. marketing for you? I think. I mean, how many ashes do you think there are in a I'm body? Not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not anticipating well, your demise, but... No, but I was thinking about that. I'm sorry. Well, about we could sell it in a necklace, and just by wearing the necklace, you're smarter marketer, right. business builder. There you go. And you get, as a bonus, you get a copy of getting everything you can out of all your... Right. Don't mind us. We're going to build something to sell you right now without you... We're going to act like you're not <laughs> right, even in the right. room. It's yeah. the Jay sure. Abraham, you know, pre-death offer. I love it. I like yes, it. This I'm is sorry, I just was thinking. So now I'm like crying because if a world without Jay, I'm like, I'm, I'm screwed. Well, you're going to be the first buyer. I'm going to die before him. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he won't. Uh, so first thing is look at this. Every week you have overhead, fixed and variable. That overhead continues whether you use it to stay positive, neutral, negative, bring in just static business, Establish business that's going to pay off even bigger in 30 days or in three years. What you do with your opportunity cost is not up to uh, the world. It's up to you. I believe that 2% of what happens to people in life are what I would call acts of God. You have no control. Uh, you can't. And, and, and I, I could go through a lot of examples, but 98% of the result of Decisions you make or don't make, actions you take or don't take, knowledge of factors, forces, elements in, in our case, business, but in life that are immutable that you either harness to your unique and preemptive advantage or you let whipsaw you and it's not anybody else. You're not a victim or a victor, it's what you decide you want to be because the external world is not playing wretched havoc. And very frankly, they don't care. They don't care if you're mediocre. They don't care if you're great. They don't care if you want to make $50,000 a month or 500 or $5 million. So you have total latitude. That's one thing. Second thing is uh, I don't think enough people play the short and long game. When I used to run Entrepreneur Magazine, I didn't run the publishing. I ran the revenue side, we had three different strategic agendas going concurrently. We had a membership, to, it wasn't the format it is now, it was a $100 membership magazine that was a, a organization and it very rarely made any money. My goal was to keep it growing and breaking even because magazines have subscription and subscription has attrition, but we needed the magazine to be viable to create the content that we then repurposed into reports that we sold in the outside market for a lot of money. So I had to have one strategy that broke even and kept abating or at least managing or overcoming attrition. And Brian will tell you, I don't know what it is today, but it used to be 70% years Magazines, ago. Yeah. So you're losing three quarters of your subscribers every year and you gotta, you gotta get at least to break even to keep your cash flowing. Number two, I had, I had activities that were current that brought in profit 
Number three, I had separate ones that after you seasoned your subscribers, you would then give them the chance to buy back issues. And number four, we created more expansive and advanced things for the future. And we had all those working concurrently, and that was our model. But if you don't think in those terms, you won't do it. Second, there's a great phrase, 98% of all, and I'll use the word uh, generously, entrepreneurs never reach their goals. And the reason is they really don't have goals. They have abstract hopes and dreams. I think about, because I really admired when Tom Phillips, or actually Bob King was running Phillips Publishing. Phillips Publishing went from, I don't know, 1,000 to what, four, five, 600? This is a big newsletter publisher in the yeah. 80s and 90s. And they did it because they had very disciplined uh, uh, guidelines. They knew exactly what every product or service category was going to do. They had monthly budgets, meaning allocations. They monitored them. They had head strategies both ways, if it didn't perform or if it overperformed. And they always had control of their destiny and the ability to adjust it. I would submit that most of you don't even think that way. Um, I love a quote from Socrates, and uh, it's pretty profound. A life unexamined is a life not worth living. If you believe that, which you should, because you should always reevaluate where you are, your values, your goals, your, your quality of being a human being, a father, mother, husband, lover, leader, whatever the hell you are. The second is a business that is not constantly examined and re-examined is not worth owning. And I really believe that. Uh, I could give you more. But I think if you, if you don't look at what it costs you to do nothing, I get frustrated with my office because, uh, and, and, and Brian knows this, there was a time when I was probably honestly for what we did, one of the biggest product service uh, seminar promoters out there. Yes. And I just burnt out. And I have a very small organization. And most of the revenue that comes is just me doing consults and spending it on being a benefactor. And they all want to do something, but they're slower than molasses. And yeah. I keep saying, it costs me 50 or 80 grand a month to do, I mean a week to do nothing. It costs me half of that to do just a break even. And you have to look at what's it cost you to be static? What's it cost you just to get even? Versus what, again, when you understand geometry in business, uh, it's quite profound. I didn't get into this, but you can take your revenue system, and everyone's got a system, even if it's a dysfunctional one. And the average system has within it, if you break it down, I don't want to get too uh, granular, you know, between 10 and 50 impact points, every one of which can be analyzed and usually improve five, 10 percent. And five, 10 percent improvement, not in 50 elements, but in three, four elements, starts giving you geometric growth. So there's a lot of things, but if you allow a day to go by, a week to go by, a transaction to be allowed to be static instead of setting them up for the future, shame on you. How's that? Very good. That's where he drops the mic on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he just did that. That's where I he. I thought just he was going to drop it on Socrates because he yeah. is like a, a modern day Socrates. He wanted to drop two mics. Yeah. Let's hear for these guys. Everybody, stand up. Let's hear for Brian Kurtz and Jay Abraham.